I had intended to do a review of the current affairs story that aired on Pete Evans and Nightcap. However, they did such a wonderful job and got everything to a basic overall understanding of a very complex situation that there is no need to explain, justify or correct anything that they presented. I dare say that as in Nightcap's particular style, consistent style, they would deny the truth of a lot of these statements that were made and would be attempting to sue, 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 as is their um, motto. Actually, I think they live by the motto to sue more than they do do no harm. That should be their new motto, to sue, <laughs> to frustrate, outmaneuver and outlast. Sue, sue, sue. So they are, well, a bunch of sues. Now these bunch of sues would actually turn around and go, how dare you have free speech and your opinion? You have no right to say what you're saying about this. Then those same sues will do a video and saying they have free speech Nobody governs them. They want Australia without the government and without the laws that are in place. They want to set up their own laws and become their own kingdom, their own dictatorship. And this is what you have to understand about what's going on at Nightcap on Minjimble. It is about a dictatorship. They are dictating that everyone have the same mindset. How can you create a community with everyone's not on the same page? So you have to put out a questionnaire that is the first selection criteria. Then you do five hours minimum worth of interviews to find out if that person is of the right mindset. They want your money but they also must have the right mindset. So what is that mindset? Well, there are two things that we're going to look at. One of them is how it all started. I've done this before, but I'm going to attempt to do it in a very simplified manner so that I don't spend hours trying to explain it. If a current affair can do an overall view in under 10 minutes, surely I can do it in under an hour? Well, it's to say that the skill of Steve Marshall and Luke Mortimer, who did this beautiful story, um, I'm sorry, I don't possess their skills. I have a lot of trouble actually breaking things down into uh, a summary because I'm a details girl. I notice the little things. Someone could talk for an hour but it was the one thing that they said that stood out of place that I'll remember. Why doesn't that thing make sense? Something's wrong with it. So when it comes to details I will explore all of them. I can't give you a broad picture, but I'm going to try and give you a broad picture here of what was actually presented in the A Current Affairs story and the difference between Bulla Bulla and Nightcap and how you can see how it first started and how it ended up to being what it is today. Now the story of Nightcap is very complicated. It is over a period of time. It involves multiple people and variations in names, rebranding, multiple company names. And it was when presented by a current affair 
what they presented in under 10 minutes was a very good estimation. Uh, what I would say would be a fairly clear and accurate estimation of the overall summary of what has gone on. But if you know anything about NICAP, you also know that Pete Evans is only one thread of the web. That the web is huge that makes up Nightcap on Mingimbal. And there are many webs, threads in that web. And each one of those threads ties to a person, ties to a mindset, and ties to a philosophical view that is all coming back to the same mindset that is acceptable to those at Nightcap on Mingimbal. Those that they are looking for, as Mark McMurtry said, we're not looking for nutters. They are just looking for people essentially that are anti-government, anti-law, and believe that they have their own set of principles that is far superior to the current ones that all human beings are asked to live under. Now why I say this is because if you've studied history at all, and even if you read Plato's The Republic, you would know that there is no form of governance that doesn't cycle into the next form. There is basically only a certain number of forms of government and we naturally progress and cycle through them. One thing leads to another and it does cycle round and round. Essentially at the core of that is the concept of we all have to live by some rule. We have to agree with our human beings around us what those common rules are. The basic principles by which society runs. Now, no matter what you do, it is impossible to form a, so a society that 100% will agree with. You will always have a minority that disagrees, that sees it differently and wants something else. Always. That is, it is impossible with free will to not have those minority that will not want to abide by the conditions the majority have set down. They want to make their own rules and ignore all the others. Because for their reasoning, they don't believe in it. They don't think it's fair. There's all these justifications they will make. Whether they're right or wrong, there is the impossibility that any system that human beings devise to live together in harmony in any way, shape or form that there won't be those who will disagree with it. There will always be those who disagree. It's called free will. Now I'm highlighting these things because this is the mindset that Nightcap on Minjimbal are after. The minority, the fringe believers who will fall in line with the same radicalised beliefs of those setting up Nightcap on Minjimbal. So what are those beliefs? What kind of a cult do they want to create? And I will call it a cult because the only difference between cult and occult is one is hidden, one is not. So this cult that is publicly displaying its philosophy, its mindset, and if religio means to bind by a set of beliefs, well then a cult that wants to bind itself by a set of beliefs is a religion. It is a set of overall views spiritual, political, social, all the beliefs that go to make up the one human being, whether you fall into that mindset, 
so that you can be one of the lucky ones that would be accepted by Adrian Brannock and Mark McMurtry if they decided you were good enough to that they would take your money and that they would let you come live on the land with them in their community. They want people on the same page, the same mindset. That's what they're looking for. Not just the money, but those with the same mindset. On this image here, I've added Tyler Tolman and Adrian Brennock here because this statement made in the Voxes was when Adrian Brennock was talking about people like Alan Bartlett and Tyler Tolman. They've got, um, well, Alan Bartlett was having money coming in. They were setting up Tyler Tolman to bring in uh, investors to use his database of contacts to bring in investors. And so ultimately, the question was arising in Adrian Brennock's head. How does he try and sell it to Tyler Tolman and others when their first development is in voluntary administration? How are they going to sell this one to them? So the first development that went into voluntary administration was Bulla Bulla. I'll tell you the story in a minute, but I'm just going to take you through the name so you're familiar. It then rebranded to Mount Warning Eco Village, then to Nightcap on Minjimbal, the world's largest holistic village, and then to the final rebranding that was done early last, well, last year, uh, May, I think, maybe even April. But um, this is the rebranding. So there's actually been three rebrandings of the second development. The first development, Bulla Bulla, went down the tubes after this man put it down the tubes. In, uh, well, conspiring with Mark Darwin. There's one of the boxes there where he is instructing on how they're going to liquidate the company, throw it into a fire sale. Mark Darwin can actually be heard in the background instructing AB, making sure he gets it right, not to forget what he's supposed to say. Because in these boxes that are presented, there is two other players that come into it that Adrian Brannock with Mark Darwin sitting there are talking to. One of them is Philip Dixon, the other one is Cherie Stokes. Now, these people are still involved with it. As I said, I'll take you, I'll take you back to the beginning. The beginning before Adrian Brennock and Mark Darwin met each other. Now, Mark Darwin here in his flash suit is, um, well, he's, he's the one that claims himself to be a whistleblower, an ex-bankster whistleblower. So from what he learned in his time working with Aussie Home Loans and in amongst financial institutions, he learned certain things. And his mind came up with a certain philosophy on what that information meant and how individuals might start to apply what the banks do. But if you go a little bit further back, Mark Darwin, um, well, I've uploaded videos where Lisa Harrison, I think it is, did an interview with him and he talks very much about what he has what's led him to the point to where he's at with Truthology and the Freedom Summits. Uh, he's done his time as a chef, he's had franchises, he made his money and sold out. And he said he retired, but he got bored. And I think it was that boredom that actually allowed for Mark Darwin to look into things that perhaps his busy bankster lifestyle wouldn't have allowed him to. 
And that is things that, well, conspiracy theories are made of. The more you look into certain subjects, you hear someone come up with a crazy claim. And, hey, I've done it. You investigate it. And, well, some of them you go, that's just crazy. Other the you go, well, you know, it's either one way or the other. I can't tell. It's it's plausible both ways. And other things, it's just very obvious that, yes, it is, well, it's a fake story designed to mislead the public because the general reaction from the public can be... <laughs> Yeah. They manipulate us through the media. They propagandize us. It is not a secret that all stories are told with an outcome in mind, a biased outcome usually. It is not usually an unbiased direction that a lot of the information that is put out there that people are getting it. It's not unbiased. Like a lot of these conspiracy theories come from very biased people. In fact, most of them would claim to be whistleblowers or got out from the um, mind control brainwashing and all the other influences. So you're dealing in very murky waters ones that when you start to get in you realize there's no way to clear the muddy waters the only thing you can do is ask yourself what can you do and that's exactly what mark darwin did what could he do what could he do he could set up truthology a beacon of truth in the seas of lies. Now, if you go back to the Wayback Machine and you look at Truthology's website, you will see that every classic conspiracy theory has been brought up. Now, I'm going to label all of the things that come out within a certain circle of mindset as conspiracy theories. Whether they have been proven true or not, it's the label I'm calling it, conspiracy theories. And why I say that is because I do know that some conspiracy theories have actually been proven to not be theories. They are actually factual. And the thing behind the misuse and overuse of conspiracy theories is to actually get people to automatically discredit any information because, oh, it's a conspiracy theory. Well, a conspiracy exists where two or more people come together to achieve the same outcome. It's not good or bad, but it's very real. Human beings do it all the time. We conspire. You may want to... <laughs> look at it as other words. You may publicly cooperate, you may privately cooperate, but all of it could fall under the category of conspiring because you are attempting, you are conspiring with others that think the same as you to try and achieve some similar outcome. So conspiracy has been turned into a dirty word <laughs> And conspiracy theories is a label that I use simply to put on all these things that would cover um, not going to the moon, um, the Queen's reptilians, the shapeshifters, the adrenochrome, pedophiles in government, all these things that, um, and I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg as if anyone knows if you've checked out any of these things. Flat Earth is also another psyops. That also comes into play with Adrian Breno. But I'm getting ahead of myself here because I'm trying to get you to understand the mindset of people 
that are attracted to truthology, to Mark Darwin, and eventually Nightcap on Minjimble. It is the same mindset that when you do find out certain things, you are shocked and horrified by it. You ask yourself, could this be true? In some f cases, I attempted to try and disprove and I couldn't. So after all of that, there is nowhere to go. If you can't prove or disprove it, can you prove it? No. Can you disprove it? Uh, no. Can you change it? And that's where people get stuck in a mindset. One mindset says, yes, we can change it if we take on force, if we get enough people, if we expose the truth, the truth will win out. Well, actually, there's probably quite a few other mindsets in there in between those. <laughs> those that say there's nothing to expose to, yes, there is something to expose, but how do you change the course of the tide? You can only do it one drop at a time. You can't just drain the ocean. You have to divert its flow. Divert people's flow, people's energy, people's thinking. And not into the radical elements of conspiracy theories. Because you cannot solve some problems. They, And if you do attempt to try and solve the unsolvable, uh, you're going to end up going down a lot of rabbit holes. But those rabbit holes are where they find investors for Nightcap on Minjimbo, where they found them for Bulla Bulla. And it is the same mindset that they are using the alt media and those that are well known and have a large following in the alt media to bring in like-minded people. Now these like-minded people are in their essence anti-government because they, like all the conspiracy theorists, accept the government, all of it, is corrupt. The law, all of it, is corrupt. They want to replace it with, well, ones like Max says that when they went to Anarchapolco, with anarchists, without rulers. So, essentially, at the very core of it, you have a minority of a population that will always be unhappy with the law, that seek to overturn and replace that law with their own set of values. The minority would make up the laws and society's conditions for the majority. This is the arrogance of those that don't accept that we all are minorities in one way or another. Whether it's our views, whether it's something physical, whether it's some prejudice, that we are in some way, all of us, a minority. The thing that we need to understand is that we do not exist in this world isolated and alone from everybody else. We are not a minority. We are the majority. We are a community and we need to have a, a set of rules the majority can follow. When the minority say, we want you to follow our rules, that's when it becomes a problem. Now, it wouldn't necessarily have been such a big problem if COVID hadn't hit. COVID created so many people that just went straight down all those rabbit holes, got stuck in this mindset of fear, 
turned to certain people like Max Egan and Pete Evans and others like that, that, oh, you've got all the answers. Please help us. We're confused. We've got so much to learn. You've known this for so long. How do we think? How do we act? What do we do? And this is where COVID has been responsible for building the ranks of the radical minority, anti-government, anti-law, want to replace it mindset. And it's understandable. They're, look, I'm not going to argue for or against a lot of these things that I've seen going on because it is not going to achieve anything to repeat what has already been said multiple times. The only thing that can change is your perspective on it and whether you perceive yourself to be in charge of your own life or whether you're a victim or a slave to a corrupt world that when truthology tells you what is really going on, you're so scared. In fact, uh, to put it bluntly, you feel like you're fucked. Where do you go with all of this information? How do you fight all of this? Well, those with intelligence will find a way through it. Those that can rationalize the, the facts of, you have to look at what you can change and what you can't change. You have to be realistic about your own expectations and the expectations of all your fellow humans around you. You can only speak for yourself and how you behave and how you affect others. Are you going to stir them up to carrying pitchforks and tearing down the government? Or are you going to sit down, talk about it like adults and say, look, we've got problems here, this needs to be sorted. And knowing when you're talking about government, it involves red tape. It's a process that it actually makes a snail look fast. You think that nothing happens because it moves so slowly, it looks like it's standing still and going nowhere. Well, that isn't always the case because much of what happens on the outside in society has first spent hundreds of hours behind closed doors that nobody knew about. All the things that act out in the world physically first were discussed, planned, well, if you want to look at it in a different way, conspired behind closed doors. So yes, you can say that the difference between planning cooperation and conspiracy is the connotation that one is criminal and bad, the other one is good and okay. All right, so maybe I get on to some details. What you're looking at here in the image is Mark Darwin's here. This is Mark Darwin. This is Cherie Stokes. This is Richard Mote and I put those two images in because Adrian Brennock and Mark Darwin here. Truthology, that is Nikki Mee from Free to Shine, they're presenting her with a check. This lovely smiling lady here is Steph. You hear Steph talked about in the Voxes, this was Mark Darwin's partner at the time when they started setting up Bulla Bulla, although when Mark Darwin left, he had a different partner. And we hear the breakup of that relationship in the Voxes. And we also hear the introduction of Steph's friend, Caroline Coman, Kaz. Kaz was actually a friend of theirs. Yes, with friends like that, who needs enemies, eh? Now, when Adrian Brennock 
met Mark Darwin and became a partner in Truthology. Adrian Br um, Mark Darwin was already going out with Steph. But prior to going out with Steph, he set up Truthology, My Debt's Gone, and that kind of a um, debt avoidance system process with a woman that I can only know as Beatrice. I don't know her last name. The only thing I know about Beatrice is that Arthur and Fiona at Love for Life had received complaints that had come uh, assumedly via Beatrice about the way that Mark Darwin was operating his business. So essentially they had Truthology and My Debt's Gone. They had a process where they were charging people to give them advice on how to, um, well, if not completely remove their debts, how to completely minimize them. Beatrice and Mark Darwin, I'm not sure whether they were partners in the um, physical sense, but when they didn't, when the partnership split up, Beatrice went and started her own thing with uh, removing debts and she also, I believe, started up something to do with trying to set up foundations. Because part of the whole process that was set up was behind the making of money and the making of debt, how to remove debt by using particular arguments in the law, then how to protect your future income by creating a tax haven. How can you avoid paying tax? Now through the explanations that Mark Darwin gives himself, he actually met Stephanie here through her own debts. And it was the same with Adrian Brennock. Both of them came to him because they had debts. Debts that they wanted to get rid of. Stephanie went through the process and clearly it became more than just business. They formed a relationship. They now have several children together. So it did uh, progress. Adrian Brannock also came to Mark Darwin. Somewhere around the end of 2011, 2000, early 2012, because he was also heavily in debt and wanted to get rid of his debts. Now, if you look at Adrian Brannock's series of directorships and companies prior to this time, you would understand, well, you think, well, to have all those debts, uh, you clearly haven't been running your businesses very well and you've been left with a lot of problems that you want to get rid of. Now, in the course of uh, several videos, Mark Darwin describes how and when Adrian Brennock and himself met, under what circumstances, when and what Adrian Brennock did with the debts that he had incurred and the very unique process that Adrian Brennock and Mark Darwin would then go on to Freedom Summits and record publicly how they did it, this very unique process. This unique process, whilst he on most occasions doesn't mention Adrian Brennock specifically, some he does, the unique process identifies Adrian Brennock. And it is the process of going to um, the fossil, the Cossel, making a police complaint that there's fraud on your account. Long story short, he did that five times and removed over 300,000 
of personal debt. So his debt process was very successful. And it's also something that Mark Darwin, when he's describing this publicly in the Freedom Summits, that it's not something that he recommends to people unless they know what they're doing and they're dedicated to the process. Well, I think that was actually a really nice way of actually saying, look, if you've got a credit card and you look at it and you feel guilty because, hey, I spent all that money, if you can't look at it and go, well, that's not even money, the bank had no right to do this, it's fraud what they've done, and then walk into a police station and say, there's fraud on my account, because you can explain that behind all your transactions that aren't fraud, that the bank is connected to it because they're frauds. So that's why it's a very unique and highly specialised process, because you have to be willing to ignore the fact of all your valid transactions and make out that the overall belief that you hold in the bank's been frauds applies to all the transactions that you legally incurred. Because every time you do incur a debt, you're accepting that debt. And unless you challenge that, no, I didn't spend that, we'll prove you didn't spend it, bring out the footage in the store because there's cameras everywhere these days. Yes, you did buy it. There you are on the store security camera. Essentially, you've got to have one nerve <laughs> that just can't be shaken, like Adrian Brannox, to have the gall to turn around and say that all of those things that he did he's going to project as fraud because the banks are frauds. So again, you have to look here at the mindset. The mindset here is the banks take from the man, the, the ordinary man. The, the government takes, everybody takes. And look, I'm not going to complain <laughs> that that's not true taxes and how much we pay, it's just never ending. Uh, but I also consider that if we didn't, the government would have no money to look after those that can't look after themselves. The aged, the sick, the disabled, the homeless, the hungry. Where would they get the money to do anything to help them? if it didn't come from taxes and other things that the government said, look, we've all got to pay our fair share if we can. Nobody likes taxes. <laughs> so, but it's a completely different thing to found it on a way to take money, avoid paying it, and then to use it so that you don't have to pay your fair share towards society, that you avoid taxes, that you give the money where you want to. You'll give it to Frida Shine Nikki here, who will help women or girls overseas escape the child sex trade. Now, it's an admirable cause. You can't say, don't give your money to Nikki, that's wrong. But you're not helping people in Australia. There are homeless there are sick, there are hungry people in Australia. Look after your own house before you start giving out to everybody else. But you see, the more that you give to these noble causes, the better off it looks. I mean, if you gave to the homeless shelter down the road, it wouldn't look so grand a gesture, would it? So, by 2012, Mark Darwin and Adrian Brannock became partners in Truthology and my debt's gone and the debt removal processes. They were, Mark Darwin is very much 
promoting Creator Foundation as all part of an integral way of removing your debt, making sure you maximize your income and minimize what anyone else takes from it, including the government and taxes. So joining into this is Adrian Brennock, Richard Moat, and Cherie Stokes. Now you can't see Cherie Stokes. This photograph here is a weekend that they had for Creator Foundation to train people in how to sell and set up the foundations to do the philanthropy and donations so you don't have to pay taxes, you don't have to be a registered company and that you don't have to answer to the government and that you can book all your expenses in, you know, all your shopping, all your bills, anything and everything, you can use it. You know, it's a one-stop shop. So this was a weekend that they held Creator Foundation. You can see them all there with their t-shirts on. Now, uh, Cherie, again, as Mark Darwin confirms, was involved with Truthology and Creator Foundation. And when it comes to Creator Foundation, Truthology and even the Freedom Summits, the girl that it, you, they, AB and Mark Darwin refer you to is Cherie. She's the girl in the office. And Richard Mode over here is selling the Creator Foundations on commission. And I know this because I've seen the CAF account statement. Yes, this Creator Foundation comes into it in the Voxes because one of the investors at Bulla Bulla asked for access to the community's account that Wollumbin Horizons was controlling. Both Adrian Brannock and Mark Darwin complained that Mary Lou's not going to get access to the CAF account because there's highly confidential information in there. Now, Mary Lou wouldn't have been asking for access to the CAF account. She would have been asking for access to the community account. So Adrian Brannock and Mark Darwin told us that the Bulla Bulla community account is the CAF account, plus Cherie with her highlighted notes on the, the account statement also told us that. But So Cherie and Richard Mote also, all of them have had email addresses at Creator Foundation. So all four, Mark Darwin, Cherie, Richard Mote and Adrian Brannock, all Creator Foundation. Here this little image here is Adrian Brannock. Up the back, that's Mark Darwin. And the only way you can find Richard Moat is he's the one up there with his classic dicky hat on. You can't see him, but that's him there. Now, none of these women are Cherie, so Cherie must have been the one taking the photograph. Cherie doesn't like photographs. <laughs> So it's understandable that the girl in the office is taking a photo of the big group that passed how to set up a foundation. They've celebrated. Now they can go out and spread the Creator Foundation for a better world. By 2014, Freedom Summits is set up. The November 2014 recording at the Brisbane Entertainment Centre was promoting the purchase or well, people to purchase into the Bulla Bulla community. So how did the Bulla Bulla community come into Truthology, Freedom Summits and My Debt's Gone and Create a Foundation and the other um, well, if you look at the speakers at the Freedom Summits and what they're speaking about, there are alternative views, concepts, ways of living and 
well, I suppose in some cases, whistleblowers. They had Max Egan on there. He's going to be the one that will really drum up the uh, conspiracy theorists. And uh, yes, Max Egan is actually a gifted member of Nightcap on Minjimble. So from the Truthology Foundation, this bond between Mark Darwin, Cherie Stokes, Richard Mote and Adrian Brannock, with all of this going on, Mark Darwin and Steph had a vision. They wanted to not only just talk about these alternatives, but to actually set up to do it in reality, to build that community. Now, prior to it being Bulla Bulla, Steph and Mark Darwin were actually looking at property at Bellingen. Now, because of all the things that had gone on with my debts gone and screwing over the banks and helping people get out of their debts and everything, and Mark Darwin would put himself out there in front and, you know, talk to them on the phone, oh, I'm an ex-banker, I know how it works, and, you know, I'll play the game with them and intimidate them. And so he put his name out there with the banks, he got himself known. So in Bellingen, when there was this land, also a group of people that he had gathered from Truthology, that they wanted to purchase this land at Bellingen. Now he also tells this story in Bulla Bulla, how he went and spoke to um, the person that was going to sell, saw what he had in mind, then he took it off the market because it was such a great idea. But what it actually came down to was a little bit more complicated than that, but it does actually make it sound like, you know, it was such a good idea that now the man that had to sell it doesn't have to sell it, he's going to take it, and, but we've lost out on the opportunity. But don't worry, we can set that good idea up somewhere else <laughs> and that somewhere else was um, Bulla Bulla. Now how did he actually get to hear about Bulla Bulla? Because he was, they were focused, Steph and Mark Darwin and others within that had come in from the Truthology movement were looking at landed Bellingen. That fell through, what were they going to do? Well at the Freedom Summit, one of the Freedom Summit conferences they had, there was a man called Andrew Cody, and he had looked at this piece of land in Mount Burrell, and he wanted to get it. But the bank had knocked him back, and he couldn't get it. So he approached Mark Darwin and told him about this land. Mark Darwin, when Bellingen fell through, contacted Andrew Cody and said, I'm interested in that land. Where is it? Let's have a look. That land was 322 Kyogle Road, Mount Burrell, and has been at the centre of a lot of, well, as the current affair said, heartache and controversy for many years now. And it was called Bulla Bulla. So I've included Bulla Bulla, the icon or the logo from the website that you find on the Wayback Machine, down here in the bottom corner, under the Rainmaker. Because this is where the Rainmaker technique comes in, where they start to really utilize tapping into previously unknown markets? Well, one of those unknown markets is that one thing about conspiracy theories, they can draw in any human being from any walk of life, rich or poor. What they're after are the ones that are, well, not necessarily rich, because rich might indicate they might have a bit of 
intelligence and might not actually want to um, gamble their money. But also the rich can be coerced into gambling with their money if fear drives them enough. If the fear of not spending that money and trying to do something to change something drives them more than their fear of losing money. I have taken a fair while to get through this, I do apologise. But it is important to understand that the mindset is crucial. Yeah, it's like watching a con that you can only con people if those people believe what you're telling them. So ultimately you need to be very selective about, well, if I fed that line to someone, they're just going to see straight through it. But that one over there, that one, yeah, I could feed that one a line and then hook them in and do some more. I mean, essentially, they are sales techniques. They are motivational. They are, um, well, to a large degree, Mark Darwin and Adrian Brennock do focus on trying to read body language trying to manipulate people's body language and everything that they can ascertain from that to their advantage and against that person if need be. Because it is all about serving their own self-interests here and how they've found a niche market that they can make money out of. Conspiracy theories, selling people on how to get away from the criminal banks, how to set up your own foundation so that your income is all yours, you don't have to share any of it. Well, as I've said about taxes, remember, I'm sure everyone out there in the world could, could think of someone that they know of that would not be able to manage on their own, can't manage on their own, is too old and frail. There, there is a need for a structure of governance when all people have to live in the same space. And the same space is the planet. Now the people that are coming in, once they start promoting Bulla Bulla, it is then purchased. All of these people are at the foundation of Truthology, Freedom Summit, My Debt's Gone and Create a Foundation that then formulated Bulla Bulla to bring in people. Most of them came through the Truthology and Freedom Summit connections to buy in to a community of like-minded people. Now we've got our like-minded people that have purchased land as well as setting up in the Mount Burrell commercial area to purchase that to bring those profits back to these people and the investors that paid for the land and ultimately paid for Mount Burrell commercial as well. So who are the people that were involved at Bulla Bulla? We've got Mark Darwin here, Adrian Brennock. Up here we've got Philip Dixon and Cherie Stokes. Those four make up four-way chat on the voxes that have been uploaded. Over here we've got Derek Zillman, Mark McMurtry and under this scary creepy face hang on I just wanted to show that image because that's actually the image he portrays everywhere this image is oh sorry I'll delete that that's him on low if you zoom in on that he's yeah uh, serving under a king a drug kingpin and uh, pervert the course of justice is uh, your typical low life. 
He's got a very charming manner too, just much like Mark McMurtry. Anyway, uh, this one over here, Richard Mote. So what we have here at Bulla Bulla, and I'm not putting any of the investors in, none of this is including, these are the basics. This does not include a lot of the peripherals, the investors, other associates, and connections in various places. These are purely the people that are involved with setting up Bulla Bulla, promoting and selling it. And as you can see here, we've got Mark Darwin, Adrian Brannock, Cherie Stokes, and Richard Mote, who were all part of Creative Foundation and the Truthology Freedom Summits everything. Now, of those four that I've just mentioned, Mark Darwin here left around 2017-18. So he was part of Bulla Bulla and the early settings up of the Mount Warning Eco Village, which was once you've heard in the Voxes, everything went pear shaped. Once it finished going pear shape, virtually a year after the last of the Voxes that we've heard, Adrian Brennock did Port Wollumbin Horizons into liquidation and the asset has been liquidated and sold back to NCV Enterprises, which Adrian Brannock holds interest over through his wife and is also promoting himself as a developer. So in the early stages, there was also the action that was started in 2017 against Gillian Norman. And the case is called Darwin versus Norman because Mark Darwin, Adrian Brannock, Philip Dixon and Steve McSween all started this action against Gillian Norman. Mark Darwin pulled out of that action and did a runner to Scotland, I think, and spent a year there. Steve McSween pulled out of it as well and all it left was Adrian Brannock and Philip Dixon suing Gillian Norman for Bulla Bulla for what she had said about them. Now the Voxes that are done in 2016 cover the first half of 2016. In I'm pretty sure this was November 2016. The details were changed on a new website that was created in September with just, you know, your stock standard, nothing had been done to it. Then images and details were started to be added. No, sorry, December 2016, I think it was. That's when it was called Mount Warning Eco Village. Now, I'm taking this information from Nightcap on Minge and Bull's website. If you go back, they have this icon here that they put up in May 2020. In 2017, it was that. And before that, it was this. So you can date when they changed the logos and rebranded what is Nightcap on Minjimble today, where it started at Mount Warning Eco Village, then it went through to Nightcap on Minjimble, the world's largest holistic village, to now to this Nightcap here. So there's been the initial rebranding from Bulla Bulla to Mount Warning, which fairly, it looks fairly similar, doesn't it? There was just a little bit more put into it. Then a complete rebranding, calling it Nightcap on Minjimble because it's now heading more into the tribal aspect of it and they want it in the name to catch that tribal aspect, much more than just Mount Warning Eco Village. I mean, warning, it's in the name, warning, warning. <laughs> so it's not a good sell. So rebranding Nightcap on Minjimble. And then here, because 
You notice here that it, even in the rebranding, it had the very, um, well, I don't know, to me that kind of looks a little bit like uh, the uh, lighthouse in the truthology, just a native or tribal version of it, of being the beacon of truth. You know, it, it's all psychology and mind games with salesmen. You've just got to understand how they're trying to manipulate your thinking against you. So enough of the rebranding. Here we are. This is Bulla Bulla. Now, all I'm going to do is point out that for the foundation of, well, I'm not even going to do that. For the foundation of Nightcap on Minjimble, Mark Darwin is still there. He didn't get out until somewhere along here. And when I say along here, I've tried to do it in a bit of a time flow where this is the core block that started at Bulla Bulla. Everything that flows out here flowed out. It flowed into Tyler Tolman and bringing in people to buy into the Mount Warning Eco Village that was rebranded to Nightcap. Then in comes Mark McMurtry with more of the tribal, the activist. By the time the land is bought back last year, we are into COVID lockdown conditions and the world's going a little bit crazy. And it is the best selling tool to drum up people that are in fear to bring them to this place where, you know, you've got it's freedom. You're not controlled and you've got all the rights in the world. So all the efforts that went in last year are down through here of Nightcap on Minjimble. And the elements that tie into the mindset that set up Bulla Bulla, that set up Nightcap on Minjimble, the mindset of conspiracy theories, of anti-government, anti-law, of creating anarchists, those without rulers. Because anarchy to someone like Max Egan over here is not chaos, it's peace because you don't have rulers. Nobody's in charge. Everybody's in charge of themselves. It's a nice way of saying chaos. But believe it or not, people actually believe that. Now, the information about the rebranding comes directly from their own website, Nightcap on Minjimble's website. You can access the WordPress documents from 2016, see when it was first set up in September 2016, and also see when that stock standard template was modified to be more what they wanted the website to be, which was in December 2016, when they put in the rebranding of the Bulla Bulla. Now, part of the rebranding occurred because of this conundrum here that was raised around trying to draw in Tyler Tolman and his database of connections to be investors in what they were selling. So they had to rebrand it and create something different and give it a different name that would make it seem like it wasn't the same thing. But the reason that, well, when we get to today, the only picture that I can take out of here in this core group that is controlling Nightcap on Minjimble is Mark Darwin. And he actually got out along the line. He still founded Nightcap on Minjimble. It's just the rebranded name of Mount Warning Eco Village that they couldn't say it was Bulla Bulla because the Voxes tell us why. Because they're putting the company into liquidation. They can't sell something that they're putting into liquidation. And besides that, the community has gone to shit. And yeah, it's, um, they want their money back. They don't want to give that money back. So they're going to cut the company loose 
the company can sell the asset and pay the debtors off, or the creditors off, sorry, the debts, and they can buy it back through NCV Enterprises that auction like they did, like Adrian Brannock said, he would phoenix the land back. And he did. And it was only made a little bit more challenging simply because he became a bankrupt after that. He had to move everything out of his name into his wife's name so that he could maintain his shares and controls and interests in this whole development. And after he was made a bankrupt too, in the name of Nyepi, he has purchased things. You know, this is behaviour a bankrupt shouldn't be doing. But then again, they do like bankrupts at Nightcap, don't they? They bought in Rodney Culloden with Mark McMurtry. So let's just go through a little bit of a, a time flow here to where you've got April last year. Max Egan is doing an interview with Mark McMurtry about Nightcap. There's a huge response to it, which Max talks about in this one here on the 27th of April. And everything is in response. This is where he talks about his 28 kilometres of sealed road and they need people to invest so they can do the sealed roads, amongst other things. And this one here is a follow-up one that Max does in August. So he's done three videos promoting a Nightcap on Minjimbal with Mark McMurtry. You can see Adrian Brannock is in there too. And from that, Max Egan has been gifted a share. So that's Max Egan bringing in on that side. But you see, Max Egan, I mean... He got himself banned off YouTube. I mean, you, you put enough copyrighted material in, you're going to get your channel shut down, even if it's not conspiracy theory stuff, which Max says, oh, they shut me down because they're trying to keep me silent. It's like, no, you keep copyright infringing. He puts clips in to ensure he gets strikes, but it does make him out to be a victim. Now, COVID did bring out a lot of people that... Um, well, newly awakened that got a little bit confused about what's going on in the world. So they look towards someone like Max because Max, you're so smart, you know it all, you've been saying this for, for decades, you know, we need your wisdom. So Max has set himself up as, you know, they all go to him. All these different factions that you could see over time, they all end up back at Max. Freedom movements, anti-vaxxers, Freedom Day. Whoops, sorry. Then down here, he does an interview with Ricardo Bosi. After being so anti-government, saying about how we should take all our politicians out the back and hang them, he's actually inciting violence and murder against our politicians all the time. But now he's going to go for this guy, Ricardo, in Australia One Party because he likes him. Well, when you look into Ricardo's fringe politics, that's also now getting a life of its own. It's all around the anti-vaxxer concept. Then you go to Pete Evans, who was also brought into Nightcap. Same again, we're looking at mindsets here. Mindsets that are attracting those that are buying into conspiracy theories and all the fears that will make people panic buy. And it is panic buying that they're hoping people will do. They hope people will panic buy thinking this is their only escape to freedom. When it, well, you're paying a lot for your own cell as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, so you bring in Pete Evans. He's got a database of over millions. But at the same time, he's coming out as some, well, he's just showing the rest of the world what an absolute fake and nuttery he is anyway. But more people are actually waking up to him because someone that talks about food is just such an intelligent person and knows everything they must. But So they bring in Pete, his database, to promote it. And there is an initial uh, flurry of people to buy in 
because of that. So they do make sales out of it. And Pete's pretty happy about that. But then, you know, Pete loses his shine. He's just one too many times. This here is Max doing an interview on the Evolve podcast with Pete. So as I said, all these sovereignty, Freedom Day, anti-vaxxers, uh, alt-media, conspiracy, they were all coming together. There are so many names that I could name in Australia now that I can identify that I couldn't before that are behind a lot of these mindsets and concepts. And these people that are influencers, Pete Evans and Max Egan, are influencing these people, steering them in different directions. Now, if you look at what's going on with Ricardo Bossi and what he plans, again, you look at the essence of it. Wants to use the Magna Carta, get the numbers up to essentially replace, get rid of the Australian government and the Australian laws and replace it with a more fair and equitable law and government system. Now, down here I've just put in a little thing that people should actually consider about their bankrupt developer, Adrian Brennock. He's a flat earther. Now, I've had this argument with flat earthers. They say, oh, you know, how do you know that you're not wrong and I'm right? And it's like for crying out loud, that's just the same as saying when a kid says to you, when you say, don't stick that fork into the PowerPoint, you're going to get a shock and hurt yourself. And the kid says, how do you know that? I mean, how do you explain to the kid that you know that? You can't. You just... Yeah, no. I tell you what, you've got to start looking at the deeper mindset behind the developers. Mark McMurtry can't even put his face in an Australian court because he's caused that much trouble over the last 10 years. He is a radical, an extremist, and anti government. And I would classify him as a domestic terrorist. I would. That's my opinion. <laughs> and others are entitled to say otherwise. Adrian Brannock over here. Well, there's one thing I'd have to say for Mark McMurtry. At least he's got a little bit of a grasp on reality. He thinks that Adrian Brannock is mad for believing in the flat earth. So here we have two developers that are trying to aim at the same mindset to build a community with the same mindset when you can't even decide which reality is real. But it doesn't matter which reality is real because neither of them are real. It's what they say it is that's the reality they're selling. They cannot achieve certain things and yet there is this constant way of wording things we continue to work with uh, that always kicks the can down the road and gives people that they're stringing along the hope that, well, yes, they're still working with them. That means that there's still hope. No. If you... Keep bashing your head against a brick wall. All it's going to do is hurt you more. That's, it's, you've just got to stop. Stop doing it. Because they will not get the outcome that they seek through counsel. They will not. And as much as they might even try and describe this as they nightcap ncv enterprises might try to describe that it is the northern regional planning panel's decision that decision is taken because of all the recommending reports and the tweedshire council's opinion carries a lot of weight it is you would say the strongest recommending 
information because it also carries multiple recommendations from other departments. So the Tweed Shire Council's recommendations is a summary of all other recommendations. It's a one-stop shop. Yes, they can go and check all these other departments and confirm that's what they said, but making it out that it would only be the Northern Regional Planning Panel and they're, they're going to decide on their own, they will not decide on their own. They will decide according to the law and according to the recommendations coming from the council where they would intend putting that development in. And also all the relevant departments that would need to be contacted if things have been done as they legally are required to be done. Now if all of those legal requirements, they're not getting ticks, they're getting crosses, big fat crosses. And this man over here, Derek Zillman, would tell you, we are continuing to work with council. We are continuing to work with this person and that person because we believe we can achieve a glossy, shiny, happy ever after fairy tale ending. Uh, are we on the flat earth? Reality? Which, which mindset does Derek Zillman have to actually keep deluding others on these issues. There are serious, serious problems that cannot be overcome by the development application from NICAP. They just can't overcome it unless they completely change it, reduce it, and break it up into at least 16 parts. Well, really, 21 if you want to be technical, because they still can't subdivide to make a rural land sharing community. So they can't subdivide 21 lots to make um, 10, 11 with the village. So even then you still have to subdivide under conditions that say no subdivision. But, you know, you can say we are working towards approval with council. That's not a lie. In their head, they are working towards approval with council. It just is never going to happen in reality. Council will not work with them f towards approval, not unless they completely change everything and bring it to within line within the local environmental planning policies and the state environmental planning policy that is currently in play. So I did actually have a little bit more to introduce here, but it's got really long. I just wanted to bring to mind, and see I didn't even mention about Rodney Cullerton here with the gap and Peter Evans getting involved with the gap. I wanted to start creating a visual to show people that there are underlying themes in the mindset of those that they are drawing in to Nightcap as investors and the politics and mindset and what they're actually trying to achieve. All of them are trying to achieve at the very core to overthrow our government, to destabilise the existing structures and laws and governance and replace it with their own. Uh, what their own is, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that our new Governor General of Australia will be able to tell us that. Oh, didn't you know? Political extremists. Uh, I would call them zealots, actually. Uh, some extremely dangerous because of their mindset. Now, Theresa Van Leishout's name, I'm only going to touch on it briefly here, but her name has come up previously because 
She is friends with Philip Dixon and Adrian Brennock. We all know that Andrew Brennan is AB here again. <laughs> so, and of course, Van Lyshout name being distinctive and Peter Van Lyshout being the majority landowner, it was assumed that she was a relative. Now what the connection is, I'm not sure, between the two Van Lyshouts, but I did actually several months ago check her out and what came up was that she was, uh, <laughs> she had just announced that um, she's now going to appoint her own Australian Federal Police and that she was doing this under the law and when I looked that oh no here she is a Bible basher with a cause uh, I just I kind of rolled my eyes and uh, left her behind I laughed at her <laughs> I mean seriously this is even better than the flat earth this this woman actually proclaimed herself the Governor General of Australia and in subsequent recordings she's ordered the military to stand down, she's ordered the police to stand down, she's issued orders that must be followed because she is smarter than them, she used to be a teacher and she knows and she can do a better job and she has told them to stand down and they must stand down. But she's not telling them, oh seriously she yells everything. I mean seriously she should have had some karma farm before she got out there with, she doesn't do herself any favours. So needless to say I didn't take her very seriously at all as far as being able to organize people and to become a threat to the stability of Australians. 25 million Australians, not this woman here, Theresa Van Lyshout, stood before, what was it, 50 people and 40 police and proclaimed herself the Governor General of Australia and she's taken over our country now. <laughs> No, I'm not kidding you. Seriously, she she says the lot. I mean, this is actually, you know, in one way it is laughable, but it's also another reason why is that the mental health system just has shut down too many, um, well, what do you call them now? Um, centers for the mentally challenged. This woman has just got a, such a, a, well, she's got a unique perspective. Well, it's not actually unique, that's the problem. She's got too many people that because of COVID, see before COVID she was saying the same things, accusing the same people of the same things and now COVID's come out She's got all these people that have ended up, oh, here's a woman that's doing this, she's acting. Well, she's our Governor General, she's giving us badges and now we've got authority. And is she arming them? Is she training them and arming them? This is a question that's actually come up in the last couple of days that is actually really concerning. Because if this woman here is, um, well, if she's influenced other people and they are following her agenda, it could, it could become very serious and dangerous for the majority of Australians. And she is tied into Nightcap. She is a political extremist that is seeking to overturn the government. She is friends with Adrian Brennock and Philip Dixon and there is no telling how much the political extremism that's already at Nightcap 
with GAP, the OSTF, and bringing in the Australia One elements. Max Egan even said, I would even do a term and do my, you know, contribute under that kind of a philosophy. So Max Egan said he would join up under that kind of philosophy. So there's all this politics around sovereignty, around freedom, around uh, standing up to the government, removing the government, removing all the people that would, um, well, force vaccinations. See, that's the problem I actually have trouble with. I'm not facing forced vaccinations. I'm part of Australia and no one's forcing me. So who is getting forced? I know that we make choices when I had to make choices about whether or not to get my children immunised or not. Uh, what I did and what I wanted to do were two different things. Because as an adult... I had to weigh up my options and in the end I took a choice that well I can't get my kids into school if they're not immunized all I can do is well raise my children right and besides not all people that get immunized get Im immune injuries from them there are immune injuries I know that but not all will create that that was before COVID COVID brought out a completely different fear level that could bring in people through Max Egan through Pete Evans and other alt media sources it's it's a minefield and they want to talk about corruption and controlled narratives and lamestream media fake news. What you're getting in the alt media is more fake and controlled than what mainstream media is. It's the narrative that they're creating there that is steering vulnerable minds that are confused rather than guiding them with better actions and more peaceful ways, let's overthrow the government. And overthrowing the government is at the core of the OSTF, GAP, Australia One, and this loopy Theresa Van Lyshout, our new Governor-General of Australia. There's even talk of removing the Governor-General and her taking her rightful spot. So consider that well, that the head of our country is this woman here and if they would succeed in a coup or a revolution, she would be the ones making the rules for Australia. She is the one directing the armies and they work under her. <laughs> if you didn't think that she's not going to milk that cow watch a couple of her videos she's out there anyway it's a long video i didn't mean it to be this long i did want to try and give a, a more in-depth view of how bulla bulla over here well nightcap is just take mark darwin out a little bit along here you follow the lines out from they could they had to start up somewhere new they were selling off the land asset and getting rid of the other investors they had to start something else and that was Mount Warning Eco Village that went to Nightcap on Minjimbo that is now Nightcap as we know it now so all of these things the only thing that's missing now from this picture is Mark Darwin has been added Mark Cora, Dean Rodimer. This has cemented the tribal aspect that they've been going for more in calling it the 
nightcap on Minjimbal, bringing in the tribal element. So that's to cement it in the psychology and everything and to support the no do no harm philosophy. Now, just quickly on Rodney Cullerton here. This little image here is the submission to the UK courts where the OSTF, in his fake name, Gun and Bad, Baddie there, Mark McMurtry, is attempting to get Rodney Cullerton, well, to help Rodney Cullerton to get the ruling of the Supreme Courts overturned by saying that the WA government laws are invalid. And he's going back to an old argument. Now, there's a thing about WA. Theresa Van Lyshout comes from WA. Yeah. Rodney Culloden comes from WA. And there is something about WA with... Well, I can't go into other connections here, but anyway. The tribal aspect that they're also trying to get in WA. Now, if you do actually look at... Uh, have a look on YouTube... You can see that as recently as three months ago, the old debate about WA separating from Australia has been brought up again. And it comes back to Federation and how WA never agreed to it. So this has, an, has allowed for an argument that Rodney Culloden is taking to the UK courts to essentially try and invalidate the law and government of Western Australia and, well, as again, to replace the existing law and government. They all have their own little twerky ways of trying to achieve it and how they would go about achieving it. But the ultimate outcome is still the same. They want to overthrow our government. This is the mindset that they are looking for in Bulla Bulla, in NICA. The same mindset that is anti-government, anti-taxes, anti all of these things. That, look, nobody likes to pay taxes, but when you do pay taxes, you're going to be convinced by all of these people that you're paying to put bullets in guns and that you're paying for pedophiles to be protected. You're not. You're paying for the homeless, the hungry, the sick, those that can't care for themselves. You want to justify, oh no, I say that they're spending it on this so I don't have to give them any money. You are depriving all Australians, especially those who need it. Because you can only skim the cream off the top if there's enough cream. You start skimping, they skimp on the programs that help people. So you don't give your bit in taxes to help everybody in society, everybody suffers for it. What I see is anarchists those that would set up their own kingdom with their own set of rules. And, well, have we ever seen Lord of the Flies? Because really, it's kind of like what's going on here, just on a bigger scale. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. I think I've pretty much said it all as far as covering the basic topics that I wanted to. To draw in the aspects of the sovereignty, the political, the, the freedom movements, the infiltration, the manipulation, the influences that are attached to Nightcap on Minjimbal. And that still at the core of Nightcap on Minjimbal is Bulla Bulla and all the people that were associated with it. Oh, when they sunk Bulla Bulla, they pulled that away from the investors, the Mount Burrell Commercial, and they stuck it over here and gave it to all the others that they offer over here now. Now, I couldn't present the whole story of Bulla Bulla to Nightcap on one page because 
there's lots of people, lots of things that haven't been associated. Where's Peter Van Lyshout, Dolph Cook and Darko Kovac, the other landowners? Where's the Cannabis Industries Australia and the, uh, what is it, the Cannabis University? Where's Dolph Cook and his wife Melanie giving out medical advice to palliative care and terminally ill patients? Where are they, well, where's she getting off charging consult fees? Do you have any medical training, Melanie Cook? a.k.a. mother of Mary Jane, wife of the Dean of Green. How is anyone supposed to take you people seriously? The fact that you are dealing with sick people, oh, you've got no conscience. And on that note, I'll catch you next time. Bye.